I hope that what I have to say will be of some interest to you, um, because you will have to listen to me for almost an hour. Um, I would like to speak on three connected concepts that are central, become central to our lives today, and about which there is perhaps some confusion. They're all concepts that need to be discussed much more fully than we can do. And these three concepts are nationalism, secularism, and democracy. These today need wide discussion and more in creating what I would like to call the new identity of the Indian citizen. <laughs> is that it emerges at a certain point in history, generally connected with specific historical changes. Now I'm saying this very particularly because people often talk about nationalism in the Maurian period and nationalism in the Buddha period and nationalism in the Mughal period and so on. No, there was no nationalism then. It is essentially something that belongs to our modern age. Um, rises in the last two centuries, as it were. And um, the historical changes that, that accompany this are, first of all, the consciousness of new identities, or the recreating of old identities into new forms. But the newness is what is to be emphasized. Um, a lot of these identities are tied into the basic changes that have been taking place in the last two centuries, elements of economic capitalism and industrial technology, as well as ideas of social equality and social justice. This is again something uh, which has existed in the past, but the insistence on these is something much more recent. And the legitimacy of claiming human rights. This is modern. And encapsulating this in the relations between the citizen and the state. Often these historical changes coincided with the emergence of a middle class. The two necessarily don't go together always, but frequently do. And these did not exist in the earlier times because the historical context required for nationalism, democracy, and secularism to emerge was absent. Nationalism brings together the people of contiguous territories into a single territory, claiming that they are connected. They claim common origins, a shared history, religion, and language. And where there are societies similar to ours, in which there are multiple <coughs> cultural communities, unity lies not only in their coexistence, <coughs> but as equal entities. This is an important point that needs to be stressed. Above all, there is a political aspiration to a better joint future. History becomes central to these claims. Origins need not be common and may be diverse, as long as they are integrated into the mainstream. And a situation where one community is given primacy over the others, and the others are excluded, um, is really not a situation that conforms to nationalism. The mainstream expands with historical change, therefore, a historical understanding of the past plays a crucial role. Eric Hobsbawm, whom some of you might have heard of, the historian of modern Europe, um, made a very precise statement when he said that history is to nationalism what the poppy is to the opium addict. It is the source of aspirations, dreams, and the future. And it is a source that justifies the coming together of a nation. But there is a competition among the sections of society for controlling the discourse on nationalism. And this leads to variations. In India, we had one 
anti-colonial nationalism, competing with more than one religious nationalisms. Some people don't call them nationalisms because they are giving priority only to one part of society. But for the sake of our argument and, and uh, differentiation, <coughs> let's call it that. Historical origins are intensely debated because some of them are used to justify claims to identity and power. Such claims are the source of the power for that particular community who is making them. History is manipulated and even falsified, if need be, by those endorsing a nationalism linked to a particular community, whether based on religion, caste, or language. Those historians, therefore, who insist on basing history on reliable evidence and logical thinking, which tends to make them a little more secular in their readings, have to be much more alert about how the past is being used in the claims of identifying nationalism with particular communities. States that were earlier independent get realigned into a new potential nation state through nationalism. It is a major historical change. The kingdoms of previous times can be realigned to form the new nation, as happened both in Europe and in India. Many ceased to be monarchies and became democratic republics, as in France. Some continued as monarchies, but with heavily curtailed power in favor of democracy, as in Britain. Earlier boundaries of kingdoms changed, as when the Mughal Empire was replaced by the British Indian Empire, and further alternations of, alterations of the boundaries occurred, of course, after independence. Societies that mutate into nations go through a process whereby the multiple earlier communities and identities of pre-modern times are gradually given less prominence. A new national identity emerges. It is often asked whether the theory of nationalism is something tangible or is it an intangible idea that is powerful as an idea in bringing communities together in a new way. Uh, an author by the name of Benedict Anderson, whom you might have heard of again, um, argues that it creates an imagined community. However, even as such as an imagined community, the idea leads to new social and political forms. The nation state that emerges is very different from the kingdoms of the past. That it is new is symbolized in the self-perception of the people. They no longer see themselves as the subjects of a king, the praja of the raja. They see themselves as citizens of a state, and this is a very different category. This change from subjects to citizens is a crucial aspect of nationalism that we need to underline much more. The community identity that people had in previous times, such as identities of religion, language, ethnicity, and so on, these have to give way to a new identity that of the nation and its relationship to the citizen. This mutation from subject to citizen is a qualitative change. It is not, if it is not properly defined, either by accident, accident or deliberately, then the earlier identities linked to communities remain the primary identity. They don't give way to the new identity. In a nation, diverse identities are certainly accommodated, but they are no longer primary. They continue, but as subordinated to the new primary and overarching identity of being citizens of a nation. The growth of anti-colonial nationalism in colonial societies brought in a significant change when the colonized people 
became familiar with the idea that they, the colonized, even as underprivileged people, could demand representation. And together with this came democratic rights and social justice. Liberal and democratic forms were essential to the nation state. This encouraged freedom of expression in every field, and even the orthodoxy was questioned. Removing social inequalities led to theories of social justice, and challenging the idea that the world and all its creatures, including human beings, were created by God, led to theories of evolution. In the 19th century, as you know, is full of these theories, and they continue. Such thinking encouraged the explorations of scientific knowledge, and these debates in Europe also made an impact on the educated in the colonies. And such ideas, combined with the iniquities of colonial control, strengthened anti-colonial nationalism in the colony. This posed a dilemma for the colonial power. The claim was that European civilization made Europe superior to the colonized world. But this knowledge in the minds of the educated people amongst the colonized enabled them to question colonial control. There's a paradox here where the colonials are teaching you something and you use that teaching to question their power. The idea of a nation and what it implied in terms of social and political change also spread among the colonized and gave power to anti-colonial movements. Freedom from colonial control inevitably raised questions regarding, regarding other kinds of control in India, namely the control of religious laws and caste reserves. Colonial nationalism gave shape to a wider nationalism in India. Nationalism implied that the older identities of religious caste and language communities would gradually have to give way to a secular identity, that of the nation and the citizen. The idea of an Indian nation and the Indian citizen started to become real. Both were historically new experiences. And I, I'm emphasizing this very strongly that what we have been going through in the last hundred years or even a little earlier, these are new experiences and we have to really learn to understand them and grapple with them and relate them and so on. What was the idea of India on which so much has been written in the last 50 years? It has been seen essentially as the evolving and defining of the Indian nation. In terms of territory, it was a country ruled by the British with changes after partition. It consisted of a multiple body of people differing in language, caste, religion, culture. They had a shared history with new people entering at many points of time and space and contributing to the culture and to the pattern of life. Attempts are made to recognize that there were differences as well as agreements in this shared history. And this is common right through the world. This is not typical of India. This is another reason why the exploring of the past is so significant, to see the differences and to see the commonalities. Anti-colonial nationalism gave a shape to at least the idea that the Indian citizen should be the primary category of the Indian nation. This meant that the older identities of language, religion, caste, and whatever, that had once been the primary identities, were not to be discarded, but were to be subordinated to the new and primary identity of the citizen. This allowed religious and other identities to be part of the substructure but the identity of the citizen had privacy and had to be a secular identity. It had to be secular in order to distance itself from the narrower communal identities. This nationalist perspective was contradicted by the colonial insistence that India has consisted always, in early times, not of one nation, 
but to do the Hindu nation and the Muslim nation, each based on identity with the specific religion. The colonial projection was intended to oppose the idea of Indian nationalism. Nevertheless, it was successfully planted in some Indian minds through colonial policy and it took root. Yet in theory, it was rejected by many among anti-colonial nationalists since religious identities were contrary to secularism and secularism was seen as a foundation of the nation. The success of anti-colonial nationalism lay in the removal of the colonial power and in the coming of Indian independence. We might remind ourselves as to what was the idea of India at the time of independence. It was being shaped by this new relationship that was being projected between the Indian citizen and the emerging Indian nation. The relationship was based on the duties, obligations and rights of each, the state and the citizen what rights and duties they had towards each other. Such a relationship had not existed before, since much of government's governance was based on precedence and convention. These duties and rights had to be set out in a constitution, and this ensured their security as long as the constitution was protected. So when these debates come up about what can be removed from the constitution, he says, uh, be sure to ask yourselves the question, what is the issue behind the removal? What is not being secured? What is not being protected of the rights that we have as citizens? One of the first acts of the independent government was to establish a constitution. The constitution that created the Republic of India and its democratic structure was a basic feature of the Indian nation. Therefore, attempts to change the constitution are a very serious matter. Suggested changes, um, and suggested changes and their implications have to be discussed down to the smallest detail. Citizens rely on parliament and on the judiciary to protect the constitution. It is equally incumbent on the judiciary and the government to ensure that the rights granted by the Constitution are in fact protected. Sometimes this is done, but sometimes the action is contrary to the Constitution and has therefore to be publicly questioned. <coughs> the state performs its duties through its governance and administration and by which it should protect the rights of the citizen. These, at a minimum, are the right to life, livelihood, health, education, social justice, and above all, the equality of status. If these rights are ensured, then the citizen would be expected to perform his or her duties to assist in the perpetuation of these rights. If they are not ensured, and not effective, then there will be a legitimate demand that they be made so. The rights of citizens have to be protected. The implementation of these rights for all citizens, irrespective of their previous identities of religion or caste, are crucial to the functioning of the nation. They should not exist only in theory or only for the economic and political elite, but for all citizens. This is not so as yet. The central identity above all others has to be that of the citizen with full rights and is therefore of necessity a secular identity. That this should be guaranteed requires a substantial change in social and political attitudes from earlier times, both among those being governed and those governing. In earlier times, the differences of caste and religious sects that defines uh, the abilities encouraged diverse identities of unequal status. Many of these will continue for a while, although identities also mutate with historical change. A national identity does not require anyone to give up 
a religious or caste identity. <coughs> but the obvious difference from earlier times is that the primary identity has to be that of a secular citizen. The new identity of the citizen has to be created, nurtured, and given primacy. It is unfortunately either not understood these days or else has been deliberately ignored by those in authority. In countries that are ex-colonies, the nationalism has two phases. One is the anti-colonial movement that helps establish the independence of the country. The second phase, equally important, is the establishing of democracy and secularism. The two are interconnected in creating the identity of the citizen. This is what anti-colonial nationalism was trying to implement in the early years after independence. Once the colonial power was removed, the intention was to, con was to continue with this second phase of nationalism. But this had been diverted, particularly through the ambition of some among the majority community who were anxious to control power. The dominance of the upper caste was being reasserted in various ways, as in the form of the new economic elite, and in claims to dominant states. Identity politics focused on the aspirations of religious political groups. Attempts continue to be made to revive and encourage the strengthening of community identities based on religion, and in accordance with colonial explanations of Indian society. Secular nationalism, emphasizing the equal status of all citizens, was not adequately implemented. These were the values that we had cherished before independence and just after, since they were to be the making of a new society of citizens of equal status. But that has not happened. We have to ask ourselves then why this has not happened. We have lost sight of the fundamental change inherent in creating a modern nation, namely the rights of the citizen in reality, in relation to the nation. But in this process, we seem to have deserted even the values of our earlier identity. We no longer uphold and defend even the positive values of tolerance that religions once propagated. At least they propagated them even if they didn't follow them. But we have ceased to propagate that. For example, do we any longer have any veneration for human life? A value that in theory is held by all religions. In theory. The assassin of Gandhi is honored with statues being put up to him. Those speaking of rationalism are assassinated with ease, and little is done to apprehend the assassins and their mentors. Young and old are lynched for belonging to the wrong religion or the wrong caste. What is even worse is that people merely stand and watch the lynching and do nothing to prevent it. That is the real loss of that. Is lynching now acceptable behavior or a solution to problems according to the ethics of religions? Or is this current apathy born from the fear that is trying to prevent the killing, that in trying to prevent the killing, one may in turn be killed? And this largely, because religion, in some cases, is tied to political mobilization. Or, is it out of sheer unconcern for the other human being? The social organizations run by a variety of religions do not rush to loudly condemn such actions. And we have to ask, why is this so? If human life has little value, then how do we try and invest it with value once again? Not by upholding money and power 
as the true aims of life. We are in fact facing not just an economic crisis, which is very evident, but also an ethical crisis and moral apathy. And that is very, very disastrous. Has violence become an automated, unthinking act in the unquestioning belief that it is supporting a noble religious cause? And we have plenty of examples of that in our time these days. Or is it a calculated plan to spread terror among the marginalized in society, particularly? Women, minorities, lower castes, Dalits. It is time for us to seriously self-reflect and analyze the problem and to seek a solution, or maybe many solutions. If the violence continues at the present rate and remains unchecked, it will shred Indian society to an irretrievable degree. Morality comes from watchful observations and thoughtful ways of acting non violent <coughs> We were never, and let me say this very emphatically, we were never a non violent civilization, although we like to believe that we once were, but history tells us the opposite. Non violence is more desperately needed today than ever before. Because the categories of violence have expanded enormously. We have to ask ourselves then, how did this come to pass? To simplify the narrative, let me say that the undercutting of nationalism by revitalizing divisive identities began to germinate in about the 1920s. So it's had a whole century. There were many strands using the label of nationalism and competing for power and are still doing so. They sought legitimacy for the varieties of nationalism and a label that they also came to use for identity politics. What were and are these varieties? The most significant, and many would argue, the most legitimate form of nationalism was what inspired anti-colonial nationalism, what inspired anti-colonial nationalism, and supported the idea of a nation. It incorporated the mass movement started by Gandhi, bringing in people from rural and urban areas. Gandhi used Satyagraha, or civil disobedience, as a way of activating an inclusive nationalism, bringing everybody into the fold of working towards the building of the nation. This form of protest was familiar to pre-modern India, and he uses many techniques that go back to earlier ways of protesting and brings them into the modern protest. Its history is tied into mainly the Shramanic tradition of the many sects that question religious orthodoxy and its social norms, the Buddhists, the Jains, the Ajivagas, the Lokayats, the Jangas, and so on. Throughout the centuries, there was a constant searching for alternate ways of achieving a more meaningful society. In our times, anti-colonial nationalism mobilized people against the injustices of the colonial regime. This inspired a vision of establishing not only an independent society, but a society of equals, superior to that which has been shaped <coughs> by colonial. We need to ask why this thrust towards an equitable society seemed to gradually fade in post-independence times, despite the changes that were introduced to facilitate some equality. Did we lose the momentum, or was it because <coughs> identity politics became increasingly powerful. And what's basic to identity politics is the inequality of need. Two movements claiming to be nationalist in the colonial sense were to become political players. These were the Muslim League and the Hindu Mahasabha and their successors. Both give primacy to religious identities, the primary citizen in the first case being 
Muslims, and in the other, Hindu. They both rose as alternatives to the secular anti-colonial movement with which they disagreed. They both drew on the historical interpretations of colonial scholarship. It was people like James Bill and his colonial successors who had argued for the existence of two separate nations, the Hindu and the Muslim, that were permanently hostile to each other and had been so since the beginning. These two movements supported the idea of religion-based nationalism. This meant that the primacy of citizenship is determined by the religious identity. But giving primacy to a particular religion contradicts the idea of equal rights of citizenship to all irrespective of religion. Large numbers of people are therefore excluded. Is this nationalism? Ideologies of the identity politics of Hindu and Muslim communism, or any other for that matter, and we have seen some others growing up since, are rooted in the colonial interpretation of Indian history and in colonial policy. For historians, this is a very important point that uh, where are these bodies and organizations getting their ideological roots, uh, getting, getting the, uh, the opium that they want for their nationalism? They're getting it out of colonial readings of Indian history. These ideologies claim to be indigenous, untouched by Western thought, they say. Yet history does not bear this out. What are described as religious confrontations actually may have many other causes uh, as well or alternative. The latter are not referred to, but the political interface between religion, society, and history in pre-colonial times has now begun to be studied in depth. Much of what is dressed up in the rhetoric of religious nationalism and claimed as indigenous history is in fact drawn from colonial ideas. The identity politics of religious nationalism focuses on contemporary events, but it seeks legitimacy from history, or rather from its own fantasy versions of history. This is applied to everything from textbooks, films, novels, advertisements, and <coughs> political policy. <laughs> Let me give you an example of how history is mythologized. Many people of all kinds are frequently heard to say these days that Hindus have been victimized by the tyranny of Muslim rule and have been slaves of the Muslims. Speech after speech, you hear the story about how the Hindus have been enslaved for a thousand years. Many people, um, um, yeah, this is the reason that is given for justifying any anti Muslim sentiments of our times. The destruction of the Barbary Masjid, according to some politicians, was to avenge the raid of Mahmud of Basti on the Somnath Temple. I knew that was a thousand years ago. This raid, it was said, led to the Hindus being traumatized and to their victimization under Muslim rule. <coughs> but curiously, Hindu texts of the second millennium AD, that is from AD 1000 onwards, do not refer to such a trauma or to being victimized. And there is only one reference to the reign of Mahmud of Persia in the Sanskrit texts. Plenty of references in the Persian. Sanskrit texts of this period, inscriptions and uh, books, do have the usual references, sometimes to amicable relations and sometimes to confrontations. Because with all societies where you have many groups of people together, you have friendly relations and you have hostile relations. That's normal. It's a question of how hostile and how friendly. This is common where two or more groups of people are living together, and these references go back to pre-Islamic times. There is mention of hostilities between various religious sects, such as Shayas, Buddhists, and Jains. 
Interestingly, the first reference to a Hindu drama after Mahmud's raid on Somna comes not from any Hindu text, but from a debate in the British Parliament, which took place in 1842. And the theory, one of the members of Parliament in this debate makes a reference to, wasn't there a Hindu drama? And the theory of a drama was then picked up by colonial and Indian writers, and it entered the discourse of the Mahmud. As to the victimization of Hindus by Muslims during the past 1,000 years, such a statement is contradicted by historical facts. Now, I'm not denying the fact that there were temples that were destroyed, that there were situations of hostility, but can you call this victimization? Because there were other things, other relationships that developed, which were really far uh, more common and contributed to the making of Indian society and in senior administrative positions. High-ranking Rajputs, in many cases, led the Mughal armies in campaigns against other Rajputs, and their loyalty to the Mughals was not questioned. For example, the much talked about battle at Haldi Ghat. The Mughal army, all the same, was representing the Hindus, and the Mughal army was representing the Muslims. But in fact, the Mughal army was led by two very eminent Rajput generals. Uh, and other, uh, and so that simply doesn't work. Uh, the Rajput and the Mughal elites, as we know, both from history and from a number of films that have been made, intermarried even at the highest levels. To argue that Hindu culture and religion was suppressed by Muslimity ignores some of the finest developments in the Hindu religion that evolved in this period. These contributed to its richness and its appeal and to that of Sanskritic culture. It is not only incorrect to say this, but perhaps also rather offensive to refer to the impressive authors of these texts and teachings associated with Hinduism in this period as people who were enslaved or victimized. Sanskrit works in philosophy and literature of this period were major contributions to Hindu and Sanskrit cultures. Sayana wrote a much quoted commentary on the Rig Veda, others on the Vedic corpus of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. These commentaries flowed out century after century and were the source of a great deal of the debate across the country. You had scholars from the south going up north and that kind of thing. Compendia were written on the philosophical schools, as for example, uh, Madhvacharya's very famous Sarvadarshan Sangraha, uh, and were discussed very widely in the Brahman Maps. And this is a particularly important text, so important tradition. Because it begins uh, with Madhvacharya saying, um, I am starting, the first chapter is on the Charvaka and the Lokayata philosophy. I personally disagree with it altogether. But since there are people who support it, I am giving the details of this philosophy. And it starts with a very long chapter on the Charvaka and the Lokayata. And one wishes that today the same kind of writing existed with people saying, I disagree entirely with this philosophy, but because there are people who support it, and the yeah, impressive people who support it, I am discussing it. The founder of the Vaishnava Pushtimar Sampradaya, uh, Vallabhacharya, traveled north to Vrindavan, and that was the first time when the topography of the worship of Krishna at Vrindavan uh, Krishna was it was marked out as places of pilgrimage. This was in the 14th century, and Rinda one was then under Muslim rule or under the rule of Muslim government. This worship of Krishna had Muslim devotees as well by the 16th century, the foremost amongst them being Ras Khan and Abdul Rahim Khane Khana, whose verses are still sung as Bandishes in the Hindustani classical music. The Ramanandan sect exalted Ayodhya 
for the worship of Ra. This is the same theory. <laughs> New versions of the Ram Katha, the story of Ram, were written in the emerging regional languages such as the Kritivas in Bengali and Tulsidas's Ram Katanas in Hindi. These were not the writings of an enslaved people, but the writings of a highly creative people. Jain and Brahmin scholars at the Mughal court supervised the translation of Sanskrit texts into Persian. This activity complemented the widely popular teaching of a range of bhakti sats, teachings that gave new forms to popular Hinduism. These are often the forms that are still observed and practiced in our times. In fact, a lot of the practice of Hindu rituals, rites, beliefs, and so on go back to precisely this period and these teachings. They were not the activities of victimized people. The authors of these texts and the bhakti teachers were people who were confident of their culture and religion. They went forth fearlessly to preach their religious ideas. And they came from every level of society, from the Brahman to the Chamar to the Dittanta. And they had their own centers with large followings. These had as much dignity as uh, the teachers among the Sufis with whom there were conversations on religious matters. The irony, irony of it all is that the people who were actually victimized, not just in the last thousand years, but in the last two thousand years, and have been so, were not the Hindus, but those that had been excluded by caste Hindus and who continued to be so. More of this. These were not very often referred to as the Avarnas, those outside the Varna system, those outside caste, who lived in ghettos outside the settlements, segregated from villages and towns, and were treated as genetically impure and polluted. We therefore have to be very careful in rushing to assign victimization to whomever. Discrimination in Indian society, and more so in the society, against those regarded as being outside the boundary of caste was always severe. Ideologies that give priority to a particular religious community contradict the secular. Secularism is a concept that we need to discuss far more fully. It's very often dismissed simply as the confrontation of church and state. It's not that. It's got many dimensions to it uh, with which we are not sufficiently familiar. Um, during the national movement, secularism had a limited definition of referring only to the coexistence of all religions. Communal ideologies supported establishing states with religious identities. This meant that the Islamic, this meant the Islamic and the Hindu identities. And this diverted support for the anti from the anti-colonial movement and was exactly what the British wanted. To avoid this, it was constantly said that all religions coexisted in India without any one of them having privacy. And of course, the one person whose uh, uh, edicts are always referred to is Ashok Maria, because he's constantly talking about how you have to honor all sects equally and you have to honor the other person's sect as well. But coexistence alone is not secularism. The more essential requirement is that all religions must have equal status and indeed their followers do. Therefore, to give primacy to the Muslim in an Islamic state and to the Hindu in a Hindu Raj negates secularism. An equally crucial feature is the relation between the state and the prevailing religion. In other words, how should the state function in relation to the activities and institutions organized by the various religions in a state? This is 
a question that is something that we're still battling and need to work on. It seems to me that religion has to be seen from two perspectives. One is that of personal private belief and worship. The other is the public social role of religion in organizing belief and worship. The public aspect incorporates social activity into the practice of religion. When a religion is formulated into a belief system and there are people who want to propagate it through faith tradition and finance, then it becomes a form of religion. These are the forms that we recognize from history and in current times when we speak of various religions. They gradually assert control over social institutions in various ways, through public rituals, through socializing via education, as in monks and professors, and through establishing institutions for the propagation of a particular religion. Once religions are formally established, they constitute their own laws regarding social norms. This is a very sensitive area that, again, needs to be discussed. These become the rules by which their community functions. These rules often reinforce the politics of the elite and of the orthodox. In India, the laws of social functioning were stipulated for the upper castes, at least, in the Varnashram term, the rules of caste, and Islam brought in the laws of Sharia. Both endorsed patriarchy. Laws relating to birth, marriage, and inheritance are empowered by claiming that they are of divine origin. Although, of course, we all know that they are man made. However, sometimes the religious laws have to be subordinated to the practice of the socially dominant groups. For example, in India, every form of religion, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, Sikhism observes the broader laws of caste. This is particularly clear when it comes to identity through birth, through rules of marriage, who can marry whom, and rules of the inheritance of property. Even more fundamental is the fact that all these religions observe the laws of exclusion when it comes to the Amarnas, or the untouchables, referred to today as Dalits. Amongst Muslims and Christians outside India, this discrimination does not exist, but it does in India. The identity of the religious community is determined both by the beliefs it follows and the laws, the social laws in the British construction of Indian society because we continue to endorse the idea that it consists of a majority community and many minority communities, all identified by religion. These ideas did not exist in pre-colonial times since there was no method of counting the numbers in the system of census for each religious community. But in 1872, the British government held a census in some of their territories, and each person had to declare her religion, his or her religion. The majority was that of Hindus, followed by Muslim, Christian, and other minorities. We as Indians accepted the division into majority and minority communities defined by religion. These have now entered the discussion on politics and democracy. They have become embedded in how rights are demanded and conceded and claims made extending even to property. But defining a community by the permanent identity of religion or caste and treating these as units of democracy is actually a negation of in a democratic polity, there are no permanent majorities or minorities. What makes up a majority is when a variety of unconnected individuals gather together in support of the same opinion or action on a particular issue. So, those making up the majority of an issue today 
are likely to change on another issue tomorrow and on each issue as it comes along. This means that there can be no permanent majority uh, based on a single identity. When Nehru fought for and introduced adult suffrage in the 1950s, he wanted that each voter should use his or her vote in an independent manner. But subsequently, political parties used money and power to organize what we now call euphemously vote banks. The electorate is divided into caste or religious groups, and political parties seek their support by using these identities. The autonomy of the voter is curtailed by the appeal to religion or caste or language or whatever that single identity might be. And using vote banks on a large scale is in reality a mechanism for ultimately destroying democracy. Let me conclude now then by stating that much of what I have said is not new. We go talk about these things for time and memorial the last 70, 70 years. These are issues that are being raised by people in various parts of the country. Those that speak of them are thoughtful people. They are seeking rational ways of understanding the change that we are undergoing in the process of becoming a nation. There is an anxiety about the insufficiency of public debate and discussion on questions relating to those, these changes concerning nationalism, secularism, and democracy. Implicit in this is also the concern for at least two other aspects of public life that have a direct bearing on these issues. These are firstly, how do we educate our citizens through the content of what is taught in school and university, and doing so through methods of questioning existing knowledge in order to discover new knowledge. And secondly, are our civil laws such that they uphold the values of the kind of society that we inspire. These concepts that determine our socio-political life require us to understand what it means to be a secular democratic nation and how it is different from what was there before or from the alternatives that are being currently suggested to us. The past cannot be enough but we need to understand it and explain it. We do not need to fantasize it. It has to be understood through a reasoned analysis. And the concepts that I have spoken about cannot be reduced to slogans. That's not enough. They have values embedded in them that have to be defended, protected, thought about, and discussed in the I have attempted to show the inherent <coughs> intrinsic connection between nationalism, secularism, and democracy. The weakening or the erosion of any one of these inevitably reduces the effectiveness of the other two. It is incumbent upon us not only to be aware of the integrated whole, but to attempt to make the integration a reality. It is only then that the obligations and duties of both the citizen and the state will be properly understood 